before I get too far, I want to make sure my microphone is working. Sometimes I can't hear myself and I wonder. There we go. All right, all right. I can always hear myself. I just can't always hear myself thinking, right? So, all right. Happy All Saints Day. It is good to be back all together when we celebrate these feast days. And what a joy it is to see the brights of your eyes and you showing up and, and just being present to them with us. <laughs> and what a joy it is to have some baptisms lined up as well. Boy, that's a lot of fun and a great joy. And a reminder not only of the baptismal covenant, but our role in that baptismal covenant for one another and not just for ourselves. And as we celebrate All Saints Day and contemplate our baptismal vows, I want to make sure I make something absolutely clear. And I won't say that it's once for all because I will absolutely repeat this as well. But I want everybody to be crystal clear that God loves you. God loves you. I don't want any doubt about it in the room. God loves you. I think some of you are thinking, yeah, 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 I, I get it, I know. God loves you. This is an essential message of the gospel, and it can't be stated enough, and it needs to be stated so explicitly from time to time because it slips on by us. We start thinking about maybe how we've not lived up to our baptismal covenant or how we have not been our best selves, and God still loves you. There's no question, and there's not something that you do or don't do that earn, earns God's love. This love, it's not transactional. Whatever other experiences you may have of love in your life, God's love, God loves you. It doesn't matter who you've been, where you've been, what you've done. It doesn't matter if you've made that commitment out loud before people or in your own heart. God loves you no matter what. That's a hard love for us to even imagine. And I would suggest to you that really God's love is beyond our comprehension, even our collective comprehension. It is part of why we need many voices to declare the love of God. It helps when we have things like reflections of love as a stewardship campaign, I think, because it gives the chance for every voice to declare how they experience the fullness of God's love as it's made manifest in the gospel, as it's made manifest throughout all of human history and the scriptures, how it comes to life for us in the sacraments that we experience together in a place like this. But make no mistake about it. God loves you. Wholehearted unabashed love for each of you. We see it in the gospel. We see the love of God made manifest in Jesus throughout the gospels, but maybe particularly where we see these more tender, vulnerable moments where he lets those gathered around him see walked with these people, having dined with these people, has a deep and abiding love for them as well. And so he lets it be seen before Mary and all of the family gathered as they are weeping and mourning the loss of their brother. And Jesus, Jesus demonstrates God's abundant love as well as the fact that that all these things we think we know about life and living are something that God actually has some say in as he calls Lazarus back to new life. Now I think about all saints and I think about gospels. To be, to be absolutely fair, I actually usually think of Matthew because it often shows up on All Saints Day, the Beatitudes. What a wonderful thing to be able to preach on, especially with a baptism, the Beatitudes. Lovely passage. Everybody loves the Beatitudes. And Matthew, blessed are, well, we don't have that this morning. We have, we have Lazarus being raised from the dead. And I am grateful for it in part because there is this, this uh, th part of our tradition carried forward 
where we look at baptism as the emerging to new life, a new life in Christ, emer- leaving behind our old way to, uh, to, de- de- to death, setting aside life before Jesus and emerging to a new life in Jesus, a new life framed by the baptismal covenant, a new life that is fully recognizing the love of God. This is why some traditions really like full immersion baptism. It more closely resembles the emerging from the grave that Lazarus is uh, offered in this gospel story. You can just imagine you have to completely submerge the person before they're brought back up out of the water (gasps) to new life in Christ. Not once, back down into the water and bring them back up into new life. Not, Not twice. No, three times. We need to make sure that they know what it's like to be born again in the new life of Jesus. We have our own ways of accomplishing this even without the full immersion baptism. And part of it is the repetition with which we remember the baptismal covenant. Uh, A feast day like All Saints Day means that we repeat the baptismal covenant whether or not we have the opportunity to baptize somebody. This new life in Christ is miraculous. Although, I do sometimes struggle with this notion of it being that you're emerging from death. I sometimes think it it might be a little, for me, it's sometimes like emerging from sleep as well. I don't know about you, but I I don't really wake the same way two days in a row. I mean, I I have a few common themes. Sometimes I wake up before the alarm goes off. Sometimes I wake up swatting at the alarm. But we have different modes of being as we wake, and I think the, the pattern of the repetition is a good reminder to us of what it's like to be reminded of our baptismal covenant and this relationship we have with God because of the frequency. We're not reminded of our mortality, the rising to new life from death on a daily basis, but we do wake up every day, sometimes more than once, right? Uh, So, and and sometimes we wake up and we think, it's a new day. What a wonderful day. And sometimes we think, is it still raining? And sometimes we wake up and we think, what day is it? Or maybe, maybe you've had the same experience I've had. You've fallen asleep on a, on a road trip and you literally think, where am I? And are we still going in the right direction? I like this notion of waking to Christ because I see it as linked to our daily office as well. There's a beautiful tradition, especially in monastic settings, that the very first words that are uttered are the words of morning prayer. That there's a a, a silence in the monastic... great first thought. Now, if I could get that to be the first thought in my head instead of what day is it, I think I'd live a, a renewed life. I, I, I strive for that. It's often not until I'm brushing my teeth that I remember, ah, yes, oh Lord, open my lips so that my soul may proclaim your praise. In the same vein, often in monastic settings, The last words spoken are those of Compline. This may be more easily accomplished. We often have greater intentionality with our final thoughts than we do with our first thoughts. Maybe we feel like we have a little more control over them, or maybe that's just me. But but I I have a, a beautiful story of a monastic setting where they would all lay in bed in their own rooms at the end of the day, leaving their doors open and pray Compline collectively, and gradually the voices would fall off as people fell asleep in the middle of prayer. Now, you might have been raised thinking you're not allowed to fall asleep. You better stay awake during prayer. But if you fall asleep to Compline every night, I think that's a pretty blessed life. These may be things that help us with our baptismal covenant. And then you may have noticed we had this this reading from Hebrews uh, among our scriptures this morning, too. We've been in this series. Now, rightfully... 
uh, as part of the All Saints Day lections, we actually speak, uh, it, the, the lection is from Revelation. It's a beautiful passage that I hate to forgo about the new heaven and the new earth created in Christ. But the, the repetition that is mentioned in this letter to the Hebrews that was assigned for this day is actually a great connection because Jesus comes. It tells us, I mean, the last few chapters have been about Jesus' priesthood and how he exemplifies priesthood, a priesthood that we are all called to in our own belief, a priesthood that we are all called to in our baptismal covenant and reminded of as we witness these vows today. And the repetition that's mentioned, he says he comes once for all. Now, that's for all, all of us. And it's once for all time. The sacrifice that Christ makes is one that is sufficient for all time. Christ, in his sacrifice, sets away the system of atonement for sin that we had known in bringing forth animals to be sacrificed on an, on an altar and instead reframes it with the expectation and knowledge that God loves us no matter what. We can't earn that through a sacrifice. That God loves us and God will pursue us. Perpetual pursuing of us. Because God loves us. And expects nothing in return. We do not need to do anything for God to love us. We do have the opportunity to pursue God in return. We get to choose whether we will pursue God in the same way or in a way that resembles the way that God pursues us. We, we get to choose if we will demonstrate our love to God. And in Jesus, we have the perfect example of what this looks like. In Jesus, we set aside the old system of atonement for sin and set forward a new path that says God is love and we declare his love by serving one another. We declare God's love in our very actions. We declare God's love in the baptismal covenant, but that frame our entire day in prayer and in pursuit in the declaration of our own love for God. God loves us not because of our baptism. Our baptism declares our love to God. Jesus' sacrifice need not be repeated. God's love comes perpetually. Our love ought to be declared as we are ready. And I hope that we might declare our love perpetually as God continues to send reminders of the love we experience in God. Amen.